Welcome back, everybody. In his first appearance at the UN General Assembly, Donald Trump set a grim, combative tone. He outlined his nationalist ideology and referred to U.S. sovereignty repeatedly, making it clear the U.S. will act in its own self-interest and other countries should do the same. He called the Iran nuclear deal an embarrassment. He also issued a dire warning to North Korea. The United States has great strength and patience. But if it is forced to defend itself or its allies, we will have no choice but to totally destroy North Korea. Rocket Man is on a suicide mission for himself and for his regime. The United States is ready, willing, and able. But hopefully, this will not be necessary. That's what the United Nations is all about. Ian Lee joins us now from Seoul, South Korea. Um, so, Ian, name calling and threats of total destruction from the U.S. president. Uh, how is that likely to play out with the North Koreans? Not well, uh, John. As simply put, we know that Kim Jong Un is not going to be like to call being called Rocket Man, and, and he doesn't take too kindly to threats against his regime, and, and that's really what what's pushing him to develop a nuclear weapon. And we haven't heard officially from the North Koreans, and it really could be more what they do instead of what they say. They could carry out another test in defi act of a defiance and things we've seen from the regime in the past. You know, the interesting thing, too, John, was the reaction from South Korea. We heard from the president's spokesman saying that the uh, unprecedentedly long speech uh, showed that um, it illustrates that America is serious about North Korea, saying that uh, the denuclearization of North Korea is uh, the only path, and to get to that path is through ma maximum sanctions and pressure. And they also said they're in close uh, cooperation with the United States. You know, the one thing they didn't mention, though, was war or any military option, and we really haven't heard that from the government here. They keep talking about diplomacy and dialogue, sitting down with North Korea and talking about it, hashing it out that way. Only yesterday, we really really hear the defense minister bring it up as a, a supportive element, not really talking about any sort of military option, uh, because it, straightly put, John, the, the South Korean government, the people of Korea, do not want to see another war on their peninsula. They, you would imagine, have a say in it. Um, Ian, thank you. Ian Lee, live for us there in Seoul. Uh, so so um, joining us now here for more on this uh, is political analyst Peter Matthews. Um, Peter, just picking up on that last point about the statement that came out of uh, the office of the South Korean president, talking about America being serious about North Korea. Could another take on that be essentially that you've run out of options when you start talking about the total destruction of another country? And this is an indication that you know, once you reach total destruction, there's nowhere else to go. Yeah, it's the ultimate in the end game, and this is very dangerous for Trump to even use those words in this precarious situation. If anything, it should be more soothing words saying, you know, look, North Korea took a good step in not firing missiles at Guam. We're going to take a step, maybe postponing the military maneuvers with South Korea for a while. Mm -hmm. That would build confidence. And the, the president lost a golden opportunity at the United Nations to tell the whole world that we're a nation among nations willing to work as partners and not the America first agenda is totally contradictory to the United Nations yeah you know you have to have cooperation and collective security together that's what the United Nations is all about um, but also it seems that you know this was a speech which you know many people around the world may not have liked it but a lot of people in Trump country in the in the United States it's it's what they wanted to hear which are down to about 34 percent yeah. of the popular of the, of the vote the, the, the approval the population rights, approval yeah. rating of 34 yeah. percent yeah it's it's narrowing and he's still trying to hang on to those few people that support him it's still a good chunk of the population mm. uh, and this is what he's playing up to and is not going to expand his base i think it's very crucial because he can't win the next election mm. if he keeps this up not to mention we could end up in world war three literally yeah. because you know the world war one yeah. barbara tuckman the great historian said the wars are started mostly by miscalculation yeah. and mistake and error, and that's what happened in World War I. It could happen again here. So there are consequences. And here's Absolutely. a tweet from Richard Hass, who's president of the Council on Foreign yes. Relations. Threats vis a vis North Korea ridiculing its leader more likely to persuade North Korea to increase its nuclear weapons and missiles than limit them, give them up. 
Uh, so there's every chance here, a lot of people are taking this line, that this speech that Donald Trump, if he hoped it would deter North Korea, could have quite the opposite effect. It is the opposite. Every time he escalates his rhetoric, the opposite happens. You know, one thing, North Korea tests another missile, they test the latest bomb. Every time he escalates, they feel more insecure and in saying, we need to have this defense against a U.S. invasion or, a North, or an American Trump uh, preemptive strike. It's worried about that. This whole America First doctrine about every nation for themselves, yeah. uh, which is what he was sort of advocating, at the same time, he wants China to continue to put more pressure on North Korea. But for China, that's not in its own self-interest because it, it doesn't want the regime to collapse. So these are sort of contradictory, Very contradictory. confusing messages, right? It is, John, definitely so. And I'm not sure he's really thought it through and he needs to do that because China's main concern is instability on its border or having an antagonistic country, with, which is not the North Korean government. It's a unified Korea that could go against uh, China with Western troops there. So China's concern, he's saying every nation for itself. Well, that's what China's doing right now. And, yeah. and yet he's saying we should uh, or work, together. work it out, work together. It's Even against your own self-interest. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the reaction to this speech in real time from the White House chief of staff, John Kelly, with that palm plant. It did I not go picture. unnoticed. Yes. Uh, it also seems the Defense Secretary James Mattis is trying to clarify now, almost sort of clean up the U.S. position when it comes to North Korea. Listen to this. We're dealing with the, uh, the North Korean situation through the international processes and we will uh, continue to do so. We have Secretary Tillerson leading the effort and we will uh, hopefully uh, get this resolved through diplom diplomatic means. It, it does seem there is some frustration and concern, to say the least, within the administration. But regardless of what they say, at the end of the day, these are the words the president said. He can't take them back. There's no going back from this. That's correct. That's a big danger because he cannot backtrack. Mattis and Tillerson have always tried to clean, clean up the mess after his words, and this happened several times before this. Eventually, it's, they're not going to be able to do it, and who knows what could happen. Mm -hmm. So I would definitely advise President Trump to really be more cautious, to strictly listen to people who have knowledge about this issue. People who are diplomats who have been in the field for so long. He's a total amateur, and you know, with all due respect, he is the president. He needs to start listening to his advice of experts. I think that that, that, that advice is coming from a lot of people, yes. and has been coming for quite some time. And uh, I guess you know, we'll see. Yeah. You know, the French president. He spoke uh, exclusively to CNN's Christian Armanpour. He's one of the world leaders who. Yes. You know, he says he's got this good relationship with Donald Trump. Even so, he did say they have their differences. Let me ask you about how you deal with President Trump, because he says some things in person, he says some things on Twitter, his ministers say other things. How do you deal with the leader of the free world in this kind of situation? Some have described it as kind of chaotic. Some say they don't quite know who to listen to. What does President Macron use to deal with the President of the United States? I have very direct discussions with President Trump. I do appreciate him. We have a very good personal relationship and, and I have very direct discussion with them. I don't interfere in, in domestic policies and, and uh, uh, what you describe as interferences or discrepancies between uh, different members. For me, there is one voice. You're present. You're elected. You're present. And, and this is a voice I consider and as a man I speak with. And, and it's always the same thing. We, we share our views. It's very direct. And I think I think uh, listen to what I propose. What are the main areas of disagreement right now? I think the, the very first dis disagreement is very well known is about climate. Mm -hmm. um, as President Trump decided to leave Paris Agreement, I mean that's his choice and I do respect his choice and he was elected on the basis of such a decision, but I do regret this decision and, and I do want to convince him to come back to this agreement because for me that's the core agreement for climate and I, I do believe that especially after the hurricanes which has had both in the US and in France we do see the direct consequences of CO2 emissions and, and uh, all this climate change we have to fight against this climate change and we need a global mobilization for that. So we have a disagreement on this issue, but I will keep pushing. Uh, we have direct discussion yesterday. We will implement Paris Agreement on our own, uh, at the French level, but the European level as well. We have a strong agreement with the Chinese and the other powers, and I think it's very important to preserve this multilateral approach. And now that's an issue for the US itself. To, to see what they want to do 
and what President Trump wants to do with, with climate. But we have to deal with that. The uh, you know, it, it seems the French president is sort of this uh, antithesis of Donald Trump right now, and you know he's playing this role of uh, international sort of diplomat, if you like, while at the same time managing to stay on Donald Trump's good side. But is is that of any value if he can't sort of persuade Donald Trump, you know, to, to go with more of a majority opinion? No, he needs to be able to persuade Donald Trump, and if not, he needs to move forward as leading this movement to cooperate in the world for climate change, which is affecting people in the global south even worse. Uh, he has to cooperate on North Korea and get the Iran agreement to continue because Donald Trump wants, is threatening to disband the Iran nuclear deal, which was such a good deal that President Obama brought in. So Macron is for it, uh, Germany, UK, Russia, China, they're all for the Iran deal, and Macron has to find a way to persuade Trump or not just keep on playing up to him. You know, he's trying to be a diplomatic and he's, trying, he's doing a good job of that, but he has to also accomplish something. Yeah, there's yeah. got to be a, a, a payoff at there the end of the day for having him uh, Otherwise, there's no point of the whole thing. Yeah. Okay, uh, Peter, good to see you. Thanks so much. Good to see you too, John. Pleasure.